In this video, we're going to look at population ecology. The first thing we need to do is look at the demographics of a population. Demographics include things like population size. The population size, the number of individuals that share a population gene pool, will be determined and influenced by the intrinsic rate of growth of that population and also limiting factors. Another component of demographics is population density, the number of individuals in a given area of habitat. We'll also look at population distribution. What's the pattern in which the individuals of a population are spread out through the specified area? And finally, we'll look at age structure. How many individuals at each age level in the reproductive base? Um, and how does this impact the future of the population? Let's start with patterns of dispersion. The most common pattern of dispersion is called clumped. And it looks like this. Organisms are spread out throughout the habitat, but they're not spread out in a homogeneous manner. They clump together in these clusters. The question is twofold. Why are they clumped in these clusters, and why is this the most common pattern? Take a minute to consider these questions. Stop the video and write down a few reasons why you think that or why that clumped would be the most common pattern of dispersion of organisms within a, an environment, and what's the, the cause of this clumping. What ideas did you come up with? What is it that they'd be clumping around? What is it that they need to stay near? Well, probably resources like food and water. Species are adapted to a limited set of environmental and ecological conditions, and those conditions are patchy within a habitat. They're heterogeneously distributed. So we would expect that the organisms would also be heterogeneously distributed around those pockets of resources. And also, for mating and social behaviors, it makes sense for organisms to clump together. Our next pattern of dispersion is uniform or regular, where we see an even spacing of organisms throughout the environment. Under what conditions would you see organisms spread out like this, with this kind of even spacing between them? Stop the video and write down why you think this could happen. Why, when we look from above, do these penguins all have uh, a very specific amount of space around them and they don't tend to encroach on each other's space? What ideas did you come up with? The answer has to do with competition. Antagonistic interactions or competition for resources that sets up territories. This territoriality uh, allows them to uh, avoid conflict by carving out their own space. Some examples it would be like trees in an orchard, or these penguins, or the creosote plant, which does something very interesting. If you flew over an area where there are a lot of creosote plants, it might look like this picture here. It's almost as if the other creosote plants know not to encroach on each other's area. But what happens is the creosote plants uh, secrete an oil that, when it drops to the ground, uh, prevents any seeds in that area from germinating, so that thus carving out space for itself. Our third and final pattern of dispersion is random, where we see an underpredictable spacing. Again, the question is, why? Under what conditions would we see this pattern where there seems to be no reason to stay away or no reason to clump? Pause the video and think if you can kind of come up with the conditions under which we get this type of, of pattern of dispersion. If clumped is the most common, and organisms tend to clump around resources like humans would in a city or animals and plants around a watering hole and uniform and regular is due to large amounts of competition uh, creating situations of territoriality why would we get a situation where it's random what conditions would be present or lacking well we'd have a fairly uniform distribution of resources rather than an uneven distribution and it's the absence of strong attractions or repulsions would lead to this random spacing. An example would be trees in certain forests or these plants here in this picture that are um, have access to the resources but have no reason to either attract or repel each other. Let's move on to population size. Population size is dynamic. It's always changing. It grows due to births and immigration or individuals moving in and it declines due to deaths and emigration individuals moving out. If we assume that immigration and emigration 
will balance each other out over time, we can define zero population growth as an interval in which the number of births is balanced by the number of deaths so that the population remains the same. We usually measure this in terms of per capita, in rates per individual. Let's work through an example. If we had, let's say, a population of 2,000 mice, and in one month they produce 1,000 offspring, what would be the birth rate for this population? Well, the birth rate would equal the uh, 1,000 produced divided by the 2,000 of the base population would equal 0.5. That's in units of per mouse per month. If during that same period 200 mice die, what would be the death rate for this population? Stop the video and calculate it. If 200 mice die in that month, then the death rate would equal the 200 divided by the base population of 2,000, which equals 0.1 per mouse per month. Now then, to calculate the growth rate of this population, we need to take the number of births, or the birth rate, minus the death rate to give us our net overall rate of growth per unit time. The birth rate minus the death rate, and we designate that with the uh, with the letter R for rate. For our example, the rate, or R, is 0.5 minus 0.1, so our overall rate of growth, or net reproductive rate, is 0.4 per mouse per month. Now, I don't really know if mice populations grow at this rate. I made this example up as I go, but let's see what this means as we grow from one month to the next. So this is the formula we're going to use. The population growth per unit time or the growth, the G, is going to equal R, which is our intrinsic rate of growth, which we just calculated, times N. And N is our base population. So for us, we're going to have G, in our example, equals R, which is 0.4, times the population, which was 2,000. So that in one month's time, we'd have a growth rate, of, or we'd add 800 individuals to our population. So what's our population at now? We take this 800 we added, uh, net rate of growth or net growth of individuals. We add it to our base population of 2,000. So our population at one month, our, or, or our N1, uh, equals 2,800. Now what's going to happen the next month? The next month our R, our, our rate of growth doesn't change, but our N does change. We have now 2,800 to grow from. So in month number two, we have our 2,800 person population or mouse population, and we add another 1,120 during the second month, which brings our population to 3,920. Well, let's look forward to the next month. In the next month, we multiply our rate of growth times our new population size, 3920, and this month we add 1,568, bringing our population to 5,488. Now what can you see happening? Each month, our rate of growth is the same, but our amount of growth, the number of individuals we're adding, is increasing because our base population is increasing. Let's continue. We see that the next month, we have an additional 2195.2, well, can't have 0.2 of a mouse, but that's what the math works out to be, which brings our population up to over 7,600, and the next month we multiply our rate of growth times that number, and we add 3,000 the next month. What we need to do is put this onto a graph. Here's what our graph would look like. The growth in a population of mice with an R of 0.4, or an intrinsic rate of growth of 0.4. Remember, R is birth rate minus death rate. 
and we have our time in months down the bottom and our number of mice on the side starting with our original population of 2000. Let's bring our data over from the other page. Let's grab this, copy, and paste that here for a moment. We'll make it smaller. Give me one second. Okay, I made that smaller now. Let's pick a, a pin and our, our original population is 2000 and at one month we are at 2800 so right about there that might be a little high and at two months we're at 3920 so we're nearing to 4000 and at three months we are at 58 5488 so uh, right about there and then at four months we're at 7000 uh, 683 so put a mark there and at five months we are at uh, over 10,000 so let's see what the shape of that line looks like hopefully you can see that this line is uh, grab a pen here uh, is the slope is increasing and eventually it will, it will continue to increase and, and it can get steeper and we call this a exponential growth curve and uh, gives us a J-shaped curve. Now this is what will happen to populations under ideal conditions with nothing slowing down the rate of growth. We would say that this population is growing at its biotic potential, the maximum rate of increase per individual under ideal conditions. But we most likely don't have ideal conditions and so the actual rate of growth depends on factors such as the age at which we start reproducing and how often each individual reproduces and how many offspring are produced and the limiting factors that might be in play. Let's talk about these limiting factors and what they mean. Limiting factors are any essential resource that is in short supply and is a limiting factor on the population growth. Stop the video now and write down all the things that could limit a population's growth. What types of things did you come up with? Probably food, maybe minerals, refuge from predators, places to hide, space, just physical space, and waste processing. You may have be able to have a lot of individuals, but those individuals produce waste that we need to kind of um, fact, uh, filter out of our environment. All of those factors can limit how much a population can grow. And there is a theoretical maximum a uh, number of individuals that a population can sustain. And we call that concept the carrying capacity. The maximum number of individuals, individuals of a population that a given environment can sustain indefinitely. Now we need to consider how that impacts our mathematical model and so we're going to give it uh, the letter K. K stands for carrying capacity and we'll add that into our mathematical model. We'll start with the formula we had before. Growth equals the rate times the population size and we have the R max or the maximum rate of growth and we add to that the concept of carrying capacity some number that's the maximum that a population can uh, or a population that can be uh, sustained and we create this factor the carrying capacity minus the number of individuals divided by the carrying capacity a factor of how close we are to that uh, number that carrying capacity number and so we add that into this mathematical formula and let's look at what happens. If n is relatively small compared to k, then this number, if n is very small, then subtracting n from k isn't going to change this fraction very much and this fraction will be near 1. And If this fraction is near 1, then the population will be growing near its max rate. Now take a second to digest that. If n small relative to k, then this factor is near, nearing 1 or close to 1, and the population is going to grow near its max rate. But more interesting is to see what happens as n approaches k. As n approaches k, then this factor, k minus n divided by k, approaches 0. And therefore, g approaches 0, and therefore, the population growth will near zero. We need to look at it graphically. When a population starts out growing, it'll grow small at first, and it'll start to accelerate, 
creating a graph that we saw before. But at some point, as the n, the population size, approaches k, the carrying capacity, the rate of growth is going to decrease as this f uh, factor nears zero. And eventually, it will become zero, and we'll have a zero rate of growth. And we'll get a graph that looks like this, an S-shaped curve, or a logistic curve. Once again, as n approaches k, growth rate approaches zero. And that ends part one of our video on population ecology. Come back for part two.